Then I started and pastored the second church for 15 years, turned it over to a national. The next 13 years in Haiti, we started 15 churches. You say, well, what, what happened? What made the difference? You only did two in 20 years and then 15 in 13 years. Well, during the second pastorate, I started a Bible school, Berean Baptist Bible School in the third largest city in Haiti, the city of Gonaive. And uh, as men began to finish their training, they would come to me and say, I believe God has laid it on my heart to go to this village, to go to this area and start a church. And I said, well, that's great, and, and I want to help. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. We'll go soul winning. We'll do discipleship. I'll be there to teach and preach and give counsel. But from day one, you will be the pastor of the church. And doing it that way, we were able to start at least one church every year. And I learned then that the key to church planting in the foreign countries is training the national to do the work. Well... That basically is what the Carpenters Project is all about. Now, this ministry helped us for 10 years in Haiti from 2005 to 2015. And we basically have two goals. To sum it all up, make it very simple, we help Bible schools in foreign countries that are training nationals for the ministry. We are presently helping Bible schools in Haiti, in Ethiopia, in the Ivory Coast, in Myanmar, and in the Philippines. Then we help the graduates of those Bible schools go out and start churches. We help them with their personal needs. We give them monthly support for a period of five years. And we also help them with their ministry needs uh, in, to the point, if it gets there, to helping them with the building. And uh, so, you know, we need to continue to send out missionaries from this country. Uh, we need to pray that the Lord would send forth American missionaries around the world. But we also have an open door to help nationals that are training their own people and that are sending them out to start churches and reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, we believe in the indigenous policy. We do not want to create dependency. We help with special projects for a temporary time, but we want to see the churches become self-governing, self-supporting, and self-propagating. Uh, we travel, I travel, uh, to find what the needs are wherever I go. I'll be making nine foreign trips this year. I'll be going uh, to some new areas. I was in Vietnam last year. I'll be going there again this year. I'll be going to India for the first time uh, in the fall. And uh, so we're just asking the Lord to open doors, and wherever they're open, we go through them. I go, and I have opportunities to preach and to teach and to hold Bible conferences and to teach in the Bible schools. But my primary purpose to visit these fields is to see what the needs are so we can help. Now, we don't have thousands of undesignated dollars sitting in the bank. So when we see what the needs are, we come back, we put them in our monthly newsletter, we send them out, and we just ask the people in the newsletter, the churches, to pray. Pray that somewhere, someone, God will burden their heart to help and give to this need that it will be met. And they always are. It's amazing to see how the, God has answered prayers and how the needs are met and then to be able to send that on. Now, 100% of what is given, designated to a special project or to a ministry goes to that ministry. In fact, uh, earlier this or last year, we had uh, three missionaries that were supporting uh, in, uh, in uh, Myanmar that are working in strong Buddhist areas, that have gone into villages and started uh, Bible studies to start churches, and they rented from Buddhists because that's all that's there. And when they started the Bible studies and people began to come, the Buddhists didn't like that, so they put them out, and they wouldn't let them live there anymore. But during this time, they were able to purchase land. And so they told us, they said, we've got land, but we have nowhere to meet anymore. They, our landlords had put us out. And we said, well, what would you need as a very minimum to get some simple type of structure up very quickly so that you can have a place to live and have services? And they said, well, we would need about $1,700 for each of these three places, $5,100. We put it in a newsletter. Within about six weeks, that need was met. In fact, we received over $14,000. 
dollars. What did you do with the extra? We sent it to them. They built better buildings. And, uh, and they were able to uh, see the work progress. And it's exciting to see how the Lord does this and answers prayer. So uh, be, rest assured that when money is sent to a special project, that's exactly where it goes. We have uh, churches that support the ministry on a monthly basis. Now, I'm going to tell you something that most missionaries will not tell you. You maybe have never heard a missionary say this. I don't need support. 90% of the churches that supported my wife and I in the country of Haiti have continued to support us, and we are fully supported. We are here this morning to share this ministry because churches support the ministry on a monthly basis. We are here to encourage uh, you, if you would like, to sign up and get our emails, get our newsletters. We have a place in the back where you can sign up and pray that when there's a need, that, that the Lord will meet that need and maybe... Someday he would work in your heart and life, and you could help. Uh, people give. Churches give. And uh, so uh, we're here just to share the needs. Uh, we support, as I said, we support um, uh, nationals on a monthly basis for five years. We have uh, three men that have been trained by an American missionary working in the Ivory Coast. I, I was there uh, uh, maybe a year, half ago and visited these men, traveled across the country, visited their fields, uh, sat down with them and their families, talked about their trials and their triumphs, and tried to be an encouragement to them. And we were in one area where this man, one man, his name is Williams, has gone, and he has started the church. Now, this is a rural area, a tribal area. Now, the official language in, in uh, the Ivory Coast is French. In Haiti, uh, my wife and I, we learned and we speak French Creole. But there's enough difference between the two languages that I cannot carry on a conversation with someone who knows French. So even though I could understand a lot of what was being said in order to preach there in the Ivory Coast, I had to have the missionary interpret my English into French. But then these areas where we were at, in these rural areas, the people don't even speak French. So I would preach in English. The missionary would translate into French. And there was another guy over here who would take the French and translate it into the language of the people. And by the time the missionary and he were done with what I had just said and it got back to me, I thought, what was I saying? Where am I at? What am I doing? But uh, the Lord blessed. And, and, and to see this ministry, this man has started a church in just a period of four short years. He has had young men saved. He has trained them. They've gone out and started four new churches in four other villages in that area. So it's exciting to be a part of that, to be sending forth laborers into the harvest field. As I said, we have a display. I, I, we have book, uh, a booklet about the ministry. You're welcome to take these. Uh, we have brochures. We have prayer cards. And, and again, there is a place where you can sign up, put your name and your email address. If you don't have email, put your, ma your mailing address, and we will send you a letter in the mail each month. We, what we want is, and what we've seen works, is getting as many people aware of the needs, praying, and then see God meet those needs. It's exciting. Turn in your Bibles this morning, if you would, the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. I asked the pastor how long uh, I should preach or when I should be done this morning. And he said, you can preach as long as you want. But we all leave at noon. No, no he didn't say that. He did tell me to turn out the lights when I leave, though. All right. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for the wonderful message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we meditate upon your great love, your mercy, that sent your Son, who was willing to die in our place upon the cross of Calvary, become our sin, take your wrath that we deserve. All we can say is, what a God. What a Savior. What a salvation is ours. Bless this time. Open our hearts to the truth in your word. And above all, 
Help us to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I've seen Haitians in their voodoo religion trust in the spirits to protect and provide for them. But they are deceived by Satan, and though they have hope, their hope is empty and vain. I have sat in the home of a Muslim in the Ivory Coast. And I've seen him reject the message of the gospel because of his faith in Allah. And though he has hope, his hope is in a God that does not exist. I've watched the Burmese people and those in Cambodia bow before Buddha, an idol of stone, believing in a man whose body has already rotted in the ground. And though they have hope, their hope is as dead as the idols that they worship. I've observed the many Catholic cathedrals in the Philippines and the Orthodox churches in Ethiopia where the majority of the people are trusting in their church and the sacraments to take them to heaven. Though they have hope, their hope is in a man-made religion that cannot save. But in our text this morning, God's word declares that there is a living hope. There is a living hope. Now, hope in the Bible is not a maybe word like we use it today. Uh, we many times will say, I hope to see you next week. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. That's not the idea of hope in the Word of God. In the Bible, the word hope simply refers to a future reality that is presently unseen. But it exists, and one day we will experience that reality. We want to study this morning this living hope by asking three simple questions, and we will answer those questions from these two verses. First of all, how is this possible that there is a living hope? How can this be? Well, why do we ask that question? Well, because the Bible tells us that really, from where we stand in our sin, in our trespasses, there really ought not be any hope. We are dead in trespasses and sins. We have lived our lives fulfilling the desires of the flesh. We have lived without God in the world. And the Bible says there is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth good. There shouldn't be any hope for us. We're all as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Because of our sin, man is filthy and vile before God, worthy of God's wrath and God's judgment. So how? How can there be any hope? Well, if there is, one thing is for sure. It doesn't come from within man. It doesn't come from anything that we can or that we do do. But there is hope. There is a living hope. How is this possible? We see there in verse 3. It says, according to his abundant mercy. That's why there's hope today. Because of the abundant mercy of God. I like that word abundant. It comes from the word boundary. And the little prefix A negates that. In other words, it's saying no boundary. God's mercy has no boundary. No limit. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards them that fear Him. But then, how can God be just and merciful at the same time? Did God's justice and His mercy 
have a struggle where the mercy won out and God laid his justice, his holiness aside? No, never. No, never. God's mercy in itself does not deliver us. For God's merciful to all. God's love in itself does not deliver us. For God, God loves the world. God's grace in itself does not deliver us. For God is gracious to all. But God's mercy and His grace and His love have provided a way of salvation. And what did it do? It's right there in verse 3. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's why there's a living hope today. Because God, in His mercy, sent His Son who died upon the cross of Calvary, was buried, and He rose again the third day. He died in our place. He died. And he arose from the grave victorious over sin, death, hell, and the devil. And that why there is a living hope today. That word grace. You know, in, in Haiti, during the 30-some years we were there, there was always political turmoil problems. There were times when the country was in the state of anarchy. And bandits and criminals would, in the night, drive around in the into people's homes and steal and, 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 and molest and, and kill. And I, I know missionaries that went through this. Just imagine, this did not happen, but just imagine that they broke into my home. In the struggle of what took place, they were to kill my only son. As they fled, I ran after them and I caught one of them with him to the ground and I on hands I strangled the life out of that young man that would be vengeance if on the other hand I caught him and I held on to him until the authorities came and I turned him over to the authorities and they judged him and they punished him according to the law that would be justice but if the young man down I realized he was not much older than my own son that he had just killed no matter what I did to him, I wouldn't bring my son back. And I could see the fear in his eyes. I decided I'd just let him go. That would be mercy. But if I was to tell this young man, bring him back home and say, now this is where my son slept. This is where you will sleep. He will wear his clothes. You will now wear his clothes. This is his chair where he would sit at the table and eat every day. This is now where you will sit. You have killed my son, but you will take now his place. And I will be your father and you will be my son. You say, who would do that? Nobody I know. But that's exactly what God did. It's exactly what he did. Our sins nailed his son to the cross of Calvary. And he died there in our place. And now he says to us, would you be my child? He receives us as his own. We are, heir, we, we, we are co-inheritors with the Lord Jesus Christ, joint heirs with Christ. This is the great mercy. And this is why there is a living hope. Amen. Second question. Who has it? Who has this living hope? Who can say, this is mine, this belongs to me, this living hope? Well, it says here in our text again, Verse 3, according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or living hope. Only those who have been born again. Only those who have been born again have this living hope. Jesus said, ye must be born again. Everywhere John Wesley went, he preached the message, ye must be born again. One day a man asked him, he said, every time I come to hear you preach, you preach the same message, ye must be born again. Why? He said, because ye must be born again. Amen. Saying you are a Christian does not make it so. 
I can say this morning, I'm a millionaire. Guess what? <laughs> Doesn't make it so. Now, you know, I was in, the Phil- in Vietnam. We got there in the early morning hours, went to the hotel, and I was paying for two rooms. And I said, how much is it? And they said, 1,800,000 dongs. I said, what? How much is that? They said, $70. <laughs> but saying I'm a Christian does not make it so. Walking into a church, saying a prayer, trying to be good does not make you a Christian. Have you been born again? No one can answer that question but you. How can you know? Let me give, quickly give you just a couple of simple tests. Number one, when you, became, when you became a Christian, when you believed that you became a Christian, was it a Bible conversion? Was it according to the word of God. Examine your I- I- conversion experience this morning. Was it biblical? There are, there are three simple truths that you had to know and believe in order to be saved. You had to know that you were lost because of your sin. You had to understand that before God, you were a sinner on your way to eternal damnation in the lake of fire, and you were guilty before God. You had to know that. You had to believe that. Whether you felt it or not, you had to believe it. Secondly, you had to know and believe the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That is the gospel message for our sins. You had to know the gospel. Number three, you had to know it was a gift. It was a gift. There's nothing that you could do to earn it. The gift of God. Now, religion doesn't tell us this. Religion says, well, yeah, you, you need Jesus plus the sacraments. Plus the law. Plus water baptism. Plus good works. Plus sanctification. Plus perseverance to the end. But the problem is not what comes after the plus. The problem is the plus. It's not Jesus plus. It's Jesus period. (laughs) That's salvation. Have you been born again? Knowing that you were lost because of your sin. Knowing that Jesus died in your place. He rose again the third day. And that He offered you the free gift of salvation. Then did you simply call in faith and trust Christ as your personal Savior? Has there been a moment like that in your life? If not, Trust the Savior today. Don't say, oh, but I've been a member of the church for so many years. No, no. You must be born again. And if after just sharing these simple truths, you feel a little uneasy, be be aware that very well could be the Holy Spirit of God dealing in your heart of your need of Jesus Christ. Second test. Since that moment, has your life changed? Has your life changed? A changed life does not produce salvation. No, no, no. But salvation produces a changed life without exception. Faith without works is dead. Now, it's not, a, it's not that we're sinless. Oh, no. It's not that we're sinless. But, but as a child of God, we have an appetite for God and for godliness. You see, where there is life, there's appetite. Yesterday, we had a, a ham for family hall over the holidays. Well, we had a ham bone left over. <laughs> My wife bought some white beans. And she put that ham bone in with those white beans. And she cooked them all morning. <laughs> and that smell just filled the house. And then the, the cornbread in the oven and, and dicing up those onions to put on top. And that smell throughout the morning, my, it, my mouth was watering, my stomach was growling. Why? Because life, the appetite. Now you take that bowl of beans and cornbread, you take it down to the morgue. 
You put it by a cadaver, you won't get any reaction. Why? There's no life. And the same thing is true on the spiritual plane. If the life of God dwells within you, there is an appetite for the things of God to some degree. To some degree. A desire for prayer. Desire for the Word of God. A desire for church services. A desire to know God and walk with Him. We don't respect Him. But that desire to be there. For where there's life, there's appetite. Does it bother you? When you know that you sinned. But you know. Does that bother you? If you can live in sin and not be miserable, if you can live in sin and not be chastened by God, then you've never been born again. Who has it? Only those who have been born again. The third question, the final question, what, what is it? What is it? What is this living hope? Look at verse 4. <laughs> to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. An inheritance is waiting in heaven. For, now, in Haiti, there's not a lot of social... Uh, Safety net, so to speak, as we have here. No, no welfare, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no Social Security, none of that. What you've got, you've got family. You've got family. That's all you've got. And so for parents to be able to leave an inheritance for their children, that's a great accomplishment. That's a great thing to be able to do that. So that when they're gone, their children will be able to have a means to live. People in the rural areas around Gonaive, where we lived, were left gardens as their inheritance. But then the floods of 2004 and 2008 that devastated those rural areas in our city. I mean, if you didn't get on the roof or in a tree, you did not survive. Over 3,000 people died that first flood got up to the balcony in our church. That's how high the water was. And many of these gardens that had been left as their inheritance, these floods just washed them all away. The ground was just washed away. People in Port-au-Prince, the capital, many of them were left houses as their inheritance from their parents that they could live in or they could rent out and have a means of income. But the earthquake of 2010 flattened many of these homes. Their inheritance was gone. <laughs> but the inheritance that God gives His children, this living hope, is incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, is reserved in heaven for those who have been born again. Simply put, eternity with God. Eternity in God's presence. Don't make this life about what you can accumulate down here. Now we're material creatures. We have material needs. God knows that. But one day the Bible says it will all melt with fervent heat. It's not going to last. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The American dream has become the God of materialism. It has even affected how born-again believers view life and the choices that we make. God has blessed this country. As I travel around this world, I'm ever thankful that I was born in this country. I thank God for that. And God has blessed this country abundantly, and yet too often we have used His blessings to satisfy our selfish desires. We have the resources we have the resources to send the gospel around the world. We are wasting most of it on things that we do not need and things that will not last. There is a living hope that we do not deserve, but that has been provided by God for us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
This living hope belongs only to those who have been born again. Does it belong to you? This living hope is our inheritance, reserved in heaven, dwelling in God's presence and enjoying Him for time and eternity. Are your eyes focused on the eternal? Let's pray. Father, this morning, how grateful we are for this living hope. As we see around this world, so many people deceived by religion, deceived by pleasure, deceived by the riches of the world. And Lord, so many here this morning have already received this wonderful truth and know that this living hope belongs to them. How grateful we are. If there's someone here that cannot say that, if there's someone here that does not know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have been born again, Lord, I pray this morning they would come to the Savior. I pray, Lord, that we as your children would fix our eyes upon that which is eternal. We would make our lives be about that which matters to you, that which pleases you, for that's why we're here. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor?